Hi, everybody. This is uh, Gat Saab. Today, I've got uh, a very, very special guest. First, if I may say, the oldest guest I've ever had. Second, the most educated guest I've ever had, Dr. Manfred Steiner. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing fine. Uh, so I wanted to tell people about your uh, background because it's an extraordinary life that you've led. And then you could fill in all the details. Uh, MD degree from University of Vienna in 1955. Then along the way, a PhD in biochemistry at MIT when I was almost born. And then retired from medicine in 2000. And then decided many, many years later to pursue a second PhD in physics from which you graduated just this past fall at Brown University. Did I get those details right, my friend? Correct. Absolutely correct, Dad. So, so tell, tell us about this unbelievable journey. Take it from wherever you want, from why your parents told you you should pursue medicine, all the way to how you got a PhD at the age of 89. <laughs> yes, that's a long story. Well, to make it a little bit shorter, let me start. Um, I got interested in physics when I was at high school. First, I said, gee, this is a really a cool subject, as you would call it now. You know, I couldn't understand the precision that was in it. Fascinated me. Things that worked for astro physical, astronomical dimensions was applicable to the tiniest atom and the things that were going inside the atom, which is even smaller. So this was fascinating to me. And I read about it and I was... I uh, it was in the after year war uh, after war years. Uh, it was in the early fifties that I started um, to study eventually medicine. The reason why I started medicine was my father had died during the war, I was killed, and uh, my mother. Uh, she, we, I had an uncle who was a physician, who actually was in this country at one time in the thirties to give a lecture tour. Uh, and I uh, I asked them, you know, what do you think about physics? Well, they said physics, you know, it's great, but you have to look for a future that more or less, you know, pays, you know, where you get some pays. Well, I'm going to be a real doctor. You get some money. <laughs> and they thought, Medicine was a better bet, bet than um, uh, physics at that time. Well, I um, I told them, okay, I'll, I'll do that. And I started medicine. And then soon after, immediately after the uh, uh, graduation of medicine, I came to this country. I had some friends here. And... Uh, they, uh, you know, invited me to come to Washington, D.C. I started there in a hospital, did my internship, my residency. And eventually, I uh, finished medicine and uh, was looking for a, a real nice uh, specialty that interested me. I was interested always in research. I wanted to know not just see patients, that was okay for me. I liked it to some degree, but research was more my liking. So I asked uh, in, at George Washington University, where I was at that time in Washington, D.C., I asked my mentor there, Dr. Weingold and Abelson, and said, you know, who, what do you recommend? Why should I go to learn more about hematology? Said, gee, there are only two places in the country. One is in Salt Lake City, Dr. Winthrop. And I said, well, Salt Lake City is very far away. And said, the other one is in Boston. It's Dr. Damashek. I said, I'd rather go to Dr. Damashek. That's closer to my homeland. I don't want to put another continent between myself and in Austria. So I started there and I was very happy and very fortunate to be one of the first who started a so-called traineeship. That was something the uh, NIH 
initiated at that time in the early 60s in order to make physicians more inclined to do research, to equip them better for research. And uh, I had a fellow with me, you know, we, the two of us were the first of these intern, uh, of these uh, traineeship programs. And uh, he said, we looked around at different universities. First of all, at Tufts, where, where we were stationed for our clinical training with Dr. Damaschek. And uh, we looked, but it was too far. It was in Medford, which is quite away from, in, you know, downtown Boston from Tufts. So I eventually we came around to, uh, he said, after looking all the ones, he said, look, I'll go, we'll go to where I graduated from. And it was MIT. And I said, fine, I'll go with you. And when I started there to be trained, you know, in basic sciences, to be possibly a researcher in hematology. But were you practicing as a hematologist while you're doing your PhD? Well, I was. I had to do my fellowship, you know, that is seeing patients. I was free time during the day and I had some time, but I had obligations to the clinical aspect of my fellowship too. So, you know, I had to make rounds in the morning with uh, Dr. Damaschek and with all the other hematologists there. So it was a very enjoyable time, actually. And uh, after I finished that traineeship, I was looking at them somewhere to, what to do. And I found that by doing a, attending a party in Brookline in Massachusetts, and there was a gastroenterologist there. He said, you know, I now uh, have a position at MIT. I would love to have you come to me and uh, work with me and uh, get a PhD, possibly, if you can. So I did that. It was primarily directed in, uh, uh, in bio towards biochemistry. And uh, I started that, and it took me about three years to finish the uh, obligations for the PhD. And I, in 1967, I graduated from MIT, and then went to, was invited to come to Rhode Island. It was a fledgling new medical school. It was really in the very, very beginning. At that time, in the early 60s, or mid-60s, I should say, it was not even called a medical school. It was a program in medicine. And it slowly, over the years, it developed into a real medical school. It wasn't very welcomed by the other departments in the university because it sucked off a lot of money right. from them. So they were enthusiastic about it. But we had a very great vice president of the university who was the, uh, the dean or the uh, program director for the medicine. And uh, he had great connections and he was very forceful and very oriented to what they wanted to achieve a medical school. He was a great, I did some research with him he had an unfortunate death. He was very short-sighted. And at a party, once he wanted to go get his clothes, his, his hat and his coat, he opened the cellar door and fell down the steps and broke wow. his neck and was dead. Wow. So, but since then, the medical school has thrived. It has become very known. Now it is called Alpert School of Medicine because Mr. Alpert gave uh, a lot of money Hundred fifty million or something like this to make a school, and he got his name, of course, on his school. But I reached my age, age about uh, what was it, about seventy years, or close to seventy, and uh, I um, was finished actually with my career in medicine. I had a very successful medical career. I had, uh, you know, was very interested in research. 
devoted most of my life to research, had quick demands from the my age, in order to do these research projects that I was interested in. But in um, 1995, I uh, reached, had reached the age of about uh, 65, and I um, was getting tired, and a colleague of mine, or I said an uh, associate of mine, he was made chief of medicine, chief of hematology, I should say, in North Carolina, in Greenville, at the University of North Carolina. And he said, you know, you're reaching our age, you come with me, we're good friends. I uh, want to uh, open a start a research program, you can start it. And then whenever you want, retire. <laughs> so I did. I, did, I went to North Carolina, stayed there for about five years. But unfortunately, my life didn't, was not too f fond of North Carolina. So yet we had good friends there, but it was not the same as New England. We had more friends here, we had more connections here. So she went first home, and uh, then I waited five years in order to get invested in my, uh, well, actually, the investment really didn't amount to much. It was my medical insurance, an additional medical insurance for the rest of my life. That was it. Uh, so I returned to Rhode Island. After that, it was in the early 2000s. And I uh, was looking around what to do. I was just retired, sitting home, looking at television. I wouldn't do that. Sports, I want, I'm not too inclined to sports. I love mountaineering, but I have one pro very big problem, and that's acrophobia. Uh oh. Oh, that is. But I can overcome it with, you know, really, I mean, concentrating on it and saying nothing will happen to me. And like a horse getting these uh, flaps around the eyes, not looking on either side to see the exposure that they had there. So I, uh, that was my only thing. And I love to go to the Wyoming, to the uh, Tetons, particularly the Wind River Range. That was our favorite for many, many years, for 20 years or so. We made our vacation there, my son, my wife. My wife was too inclined about, she's Scottish and she loves the sea. But she had, uh, you know, went with us to look at the mountains, but she didn't do too much hiking, but my son and I did. So um, we, uh, and at that time, I said, you know, now it's time to look at answer something serious. And I said, now is the time to do, go after what I always wanted, <laughs> physics. I was now, before, before you go on, let me interrupt you, Manfred. Had, yeah. the, had the physics bug been you know, simmering in your head all these years? Or had you, is it something that was reignited once you were looking for the next stage? Or has it always been there haunting you? The physics bug had never left me since okay. high school. You know, since I get first time I got physics. I was, I said, this is a fascinating, I wish I could do it. And I always said, when I retire from medicine, I will do physics. I don't know how old I will be. You know, there may be things coming between you know, medical problems or so as you get older. But I want to try it. So I started. I, uh, first I went to MIT, but that was just almost impossible to do because I had to, to commute from Rhode Island to MIT. They took, you know, a good hour and a half by train, by car. And eventually I said, I can't do that. I was sitting in the waiting room at night, waiting for my home, for my commuter train home to Rhode Island and did my homework. I said, that's not it. And these are what? You're taking undergraduate courses in physics at that point? Well, I did some undergraduate courses in North Carolina because... Every faculty member was allowed to get one graduate course of his liking, free of charge. So I took physics there. 
I do basic physics, you know, mechanics, electrodynamics, uh, statistical physics. But did you have the, I mean, I know, of course, you were trained as a physician, you had a PhD in biochemistry, but that certainly doesn't imply that one has the mathematical acuity to be able to, to do physics. So did you have to also pick up all sorts of mathematical training along the way? Oh, well, that was part of my training at MIT in okay. the 60s. Okay. I mean, I did calculus and higher mathematics, statistical mathematics and uh, so that, that just was part of the, my training at that time so i was quite well informed i mean you know every physicist usually takes also a course in mathematics um that is higher mathematics covers you know you, they presume you know the basic mathematics calculus and integration and uh, differential equation etc but from there on, you get sort of in, an introduction into the mathematical problems that may you that you face in physics. So that was all taken then at the time when I rejoined, uh, tried to rejoin MIT. But eventually, after two weeks, I said I cannot do that. I was getting in, you know, getting up in the morning at six coming in home at six at night, doing then my homework. I mean, it was, it spent no, had no time for my family. So I said, said, you know, why don't I go to Brown? I mean, Brown has a good physics department. It has at least one Nobel Prize winner there at that time, Leon Cooper. And I said, I know the people there and I, so I applied and they took me and, uh, they took me in their program, but I said, I'm going to be a special student. I want to spend my life also with my family. I had grandchildren at that time, I mean, and two children. So I wanted to spend some time with them as well. So I said, I'm not going to be like an ordinary student taking at least three or four classes every semester. I take one or two and leave time for my family. So that went on well. But I eventually, I took all the undergraduate classes that I required and then went on to the graduate school and did all those classes that I required. Now, were you picking up, you know, undergraduate or master's degrees on your way to your PhD? Or it's, you know, you just took the necessary courses, but the final degree was only the PhD? I did the necessary courses. They did not. They require me to take a master's degree and okay. uh, but in between you know came medical problems medical issues some of them were very serious but i overcome them none of them are long lasting it's not like a malignant disease you know that will last forever but these are problems mostly related to my heart but it was at least three very, very tough problems that I had to overcome. But I did overcome them. And uh, I just took them to time off, you know, after that to recover from this, uh, from these uh, issues. And eventually I uh, finished my thesis and I had a very understanding uh, preceptor in it. And uh, I then graduated. I, this was last fall, correct? Fall it was last fall, yes. But, you know, I went, I said, I, I have, to, I wanted to go to the commencement. It was, I had to wait till May, but I got my graduate, my diploma already beforehand, actually. That was just to see how it is, a commencement year. It was very impressive. And I really, I must say, it was one of the most beautiful days of my life. Wow. When I came in the procession you know, from the university to a uh, place where the titles were given out for the PhDs, the other people in the procession went to another place where the master's degrees were given out, and then other places was, were for the medical doctors. 
So um, I went there and um, we went through a gate, a big gate of the university that's opened only twice a year. And there was many people standing and suddenly I was in my dress, you know, my hat, yeah. my, I tried, my uh, dress for a PhD. And suddenly someone on the side of me calls me and says, Congratulations, Ramfrey, come here. And it was the president of the university. Wow. He was standing there, I shook my hands, and we talked a little bit. And then I joined the uh, in the uh, procession to the to the place where my uh, title was given, and uh, you know they said being in, you know, it can be you know your the family can do some acclamation when the title, when the person's name is called out, but not too much. Actually, when I came up, there was an applause, a roaring applause. I must say, I mean, it's not to enhance my standing here, but it really was so surprising. Even they gave me my own, the old, my colleagues all stood up and everybody stood up. It was a, a standing ovation. Wow, well, you certainly deserve it. Uh, well, I mean, it was my, I know it was my age. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> before, you, before you go on, thank you for that summary. Uh, are you familiar, has the name Dagobert Bro uh, does it ring a bell? B R O H. B R O H. Bro. I don't necessarily expect you to know him, but I thought maybe you might because he shares actually something with you. I thought you might. Doesn't ring a bell. No. So Dagobert. So let me. So let me take a few minutes to to explain the context. Uh, so uh, I joined my university as a assistant professor in 1994. And around maybe 1996, I had read in the university's newspaper, I think the title was something, finally a doctor at 91 or something. And so I said, oh, let me read this. So Dagobert Bro was a gentleman, a, a Jewish uh, gentleman from uh, Germany who had left. And I think I might get some of the details wrongly, but maybe 1933, just as the Nazis were rising to power in Germany. So he moves to Canada. He had always wanted to, to study and be an educated person, but you know, the circumstances of life were such that he wasn't able to. So he so very much the way you had the physics bug in your head, he had the education bug in his head, but he was never able to pursue it. He he went, he goes on to have a successful career as a business person, and then he retires in his 60s and decides, well, now I have some time on my hand. I'd like to go on and maybe do a bachelor's degree. And uh, so he signs up, completes a bachelor's degree. Then in his 70s, he says, well, you know, I'm I'm still healthy. I still have vigor. I'd like to pursue my master's degree. Then goes on and gets, and in his case, it was in history. And then finally, he decides, well, I'm still eager to go on. And so he goes on and finishes his PhD. And now that story has made it to my next book, the, the book that I just submitted to my publisher, where I talk about how to live the good life. And I have a chapter on minimizing regret, the idea that, you know, live your life, don't regret things, go for it. And so I'd always use Dagobert Bro's, Bro's story whenever students would want, come into my office, Manfred, saying, hey, Professor Saad, you know, I'm thinking of doing an MBA or I'd like to maybe do my PhD, but I'm now 28 years old. I think I'm too old. What do you think? And so I would sit them down. I'd say, sit down, let me tell you a story. And then I would tell them the, the bro story. And then, of course, that would kind of really inspire them that here's a gentleman who got his PhD in his 90s and you're, you're whining about being too old because you're 27 or 28. And so in my forthcoming book I had a whole section on this gentleman and then when I discovered your story I had to go back and add your story as part of that section so you will be referred to in my next book Dr. Steiner. Oh, good thank you actually you know I was looking at that time when I graduated I said I wonder if there are some old people like me who graduated so I looked and googled you know and I found some people, yes. I maybe found Bro 
in it, but there was one older one in almost 100. Wow. In Italy, in Italy. She was something, uh, I'm not quite sure what she was. She wasn't one of, in, not in physics or chemistry or mathematics, but in something more like history or, or law, I'm not sure. But I said, well, I'm not good enough for the Book of Guinness. <laughs> <laughs> we are and almost there. Top three. I mean, in a sense, what's incredible about your story is you are the true scholar in the purest sense because you are doing it for no other reason other than the intrinsic pursuit of knowledge. Because by definition, it's not as though, and forgive me, I hope you're not going to be offended. It's not as though you're going to start a career as an assistant professor of physics today. So you are absolutely doing it for the love of knowledge, correct? Yes, exactly. Yes. Actually, some of my colleagues in the medical school when I was at Brown, they called me the uh, Renaissance man. Right. Because I was I was interested in many, many different things. I mean, I could, I was very interested in history at one time in my uh, young years. And I just subjects, if I become interested and then I try to pursue them as much as I can. Well, I, I read in an interview that you did that uh, you may be toying possibly with the idea of another PhD in history. Is that is that true or something to that effect? No. <laughs> no, no. I now, you know, physics now interests me so much. I'm writing a paper now. I'm trying to write it. It's a very complicated subject, part of my thesis. Uh, but it requires a very advanced degree of knowledge in mathematics, uh, group theory, and um, manifolds and things like that wow. so it's a, a very uh <laughs> i'm trying to you know do this on myself so and you know I, would you be able to collaborate with someone who might be able to fill in some of the oh, sure. holes? well yes i w i mean the paper will be written together with my predecessor because he was i mean this is part of my thesis and he was an essential part of my thesis. He gave me the subject and he, you know, fathered me in his way uh, along to uh, if I got stuck in some place. So that would be with him. But I want to do this part of this part now on my own. I want to do myself to see if I can still do it. You know. I just have to sometimes, you know, I come to think, you know, gee, is this really, I mean, me at 90 now? Um, I said, well, you know, I'm still capable of doing it, I think. Well, you know, I mean, I mean you're a physician, so it, it's 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 appropriate to ask you this medical question. In, in my forthcoming book, I talk about that there's some research that shows that one of the ways by which you protect yourself in terms of having good health is to have purpose and meaning. And there's some very interesting research that links, you know, whether someone scores high on purpose and meaning and their well-being, right? Uh, and so I suspect that the fact that you get up every morning with, you know, with the gleeful kind of, you know, rubbing of the hands, what am I going to work on next? That has to not only affect your mental health, but it has to have downstream effect on your physical health as well, no? Oh, I'm sure it does. It does, yes. I keep, <laughs> you know, I'm thinking of Poirot, if you ever had a, you know, I could tell you the uh, Agatha Christie's detective, and he said, there's little gray cells here, and they have to, they've been working there, they have to work. Yes, I try to keep them in training. I hope you could say that. I have very little else that I spend my life on. My, you know, I interact with my uh, family, of course, with my grandchildren and my children. And uh, but there's other than walking around uh, every day, taking a hike. But uh, 
the, the big love that I had once that occupied my physical training was the mountains. I know I can't do those anymore. And that is a big down let for me. I mean, now, so I have to concentrate on what's up here in my brain uh, as long as I can. Well, what's interesting about your pursuit of, you know, physics and mathematics is that while in some disciplines, age is a benefit in the sense that, you know, you're building knowledge on top of knowledge and so that your wisdom is of value, mathematics is to some extent a young man's game, right? I mean, this is why... Yeah. Yeah. The Fields Medal, we don't give it till, I think, after 40. And yeah. most of the great accomplishments that a mathematician will have will typically be earlier in their career. And it's it's, un it's unclear why that is. And yet you were able to completely break that mold because you said, I don't care about past empirical yeah. findings regarding age and method mathematical abilities. I'm going to prove everybody wrong. Yes. Yes, you're absolutely right. Yeah. That was it. Yeah. I know, you know, the, yeah, physics is really most of the uh, big discoveries in physics. If I look at these, you know, go over the big elite in physics, they are where in their young years, they were less than, well, 40, 50. Exactly. Uh, but nobody made any, that I know, made any big discoveries after. 70. And then <laughs> well, the question, you you the proved them wrong. You proved them wrong. 70, you know, was a time when most people were already dead. We are living longer now. Now, so maybe things are changing. Of all the different roles you've, you know, different hats you've worn, I mean, okay, you were a professor of medicine, you were teaching classes, you were doing research in your previous medical career, okay. writing grants. You were a clinician, so you're, you're dealing with actual patients, trying to help them. Now you're doing uh, physics. Which of those different hats did you most enjoy? What was your clinical work? What brought you most purpose and meaning? Was it just sitting and thinking? Which, I mean, I'm sure you loved everything, but which was the one that you couldn't do without if you had to live your life again? If I had to live my life, I, I could not do without physics. Wow. That, that is, is some love. Is, I, I wanted to do physics. I said, you know, I, I asked for advice, you know, at the time when it came to choose a subject. Uh, my mother and my uncle, but their advice was so clear cut. I didn't object to them anymore. I said, well, I, I, I do that, but I still love physics. But you said- And I kept, and I kept uh, really, you know, reading books about physicists, about uh, physics in general. So I never lost my love for physics. What? So earlier when we began our conversation, you referred to the precision of physics as sort of one of the things that made you love it. Now, is so I- my background actually is in mathematics and computer science. That was my, my first degree. And uh, of all the courses I've taken in my life, and of course I too have had a long academic career, maybe not as illustrious as yours, mm -hmm. certainly. Uh, the course that touched me the most was a course on formal languages. So you may be familiar with Alan Turing. Do, do you know yes. who Alan Turing? Oh yes, of right? course. Yes. And so when I, when I took that course, Manfred, it was at such a level of profundity that it almost was difficult to imagine that a human being could be thinking at such a level. There was a purity. So there was something about pure mathematics that's so elegant that it almost borders on the mystical. So I'm not a very religious person, but you almost think that, you know, if there is a God, it's, he's speaking through the language of mathematics. So yeah. is it something similar to what I just described that draws you to physics? Yes, yes, absolutely. You know, you mentioned there, you mentioned there, you know, the, um, there was one logician which I admired. I'm going to guess who it is. Is it Gödel? Yes. Ah! 
Good Pedro. Now, I was so enthusiastic about Incredible. what I read about him. And I, uh, you know, his, I mean, his logic was so great. And I read, you know, how he was, he was the only one walking with Einstein. Exactly. Yeah, arguing. And he would tell, tell Einstein, you were Actually, wrong. Actually, Einstein said, forgive me for interrupting, Einstein said, and I have this in, uh, I have a small section in my forthcoming book on this one, they go would go for walks. He said, Einstein said, the only reason I would actually show up to the Institute for Advanced Studies was so that I can go for these walks with Kurt uh, Girdle. So there you go. <laughs> yes. Now he was, um, I, I, I admired him. And I said, gee, you know, logic would also be something that I would love to do, but I'm too old now for that. <laughs> <laughs> so do you feel, so, I mean, you know, you had the regret of not having pursued physics, but then you solved it by pursuing physics and getting a PhD at 89. Mm -hmm. Are there any other regrets that today you can look back on your life and say that you still have? And before you answer, uh, let me contextualize my question. So one of my former uh, PhD uh, professors in psychology, at I studied at Cornell, his name was or is Tom Gilovich, and he pioneered the psychological study of regret by looking at two types of regret. Uh, regret due to action. So I, I regret that I cheated on my wife and now my marriage is over, right? I did something which I regret versus regret due to inaction. Exactly your story. I regret that I went into medicine, but I really would have preferred to go into physics. And it turns out that over the long term, people, their greatest regret is one stemming from inaction rather than action, which is exactly your story. So that said, do you have any other regrets that you've experienced in your life? No, <laughs> none other than the physics that really was was what really got me. <laughs> Incredible. Incre yeah. So how has the reaction been, you know, on a personal level with your family, with past colleagues, I mean, are they calling you up and saying, "Are you insane to be doing this, Manfred?" Or are they were they all supportive? Well, you know, it's it's interesting. There are many people who, after my story became public, made public in the in the media, that wrote to me, and uh, either by computer or turning with a letter, and said, "You know, I'm now fifty seven years old." I always am now in position, I forget what it was, but I always loved mathematics. And do you think it is worthwhile to pursue this? So, <laughs> but letters like this with different variations in what subjects they were interested in, I had quite a few that I got. Uh, so people are, yes, I, I, I felt I inspired them in some way. Well, to, to me, I mean, there's a huge life lesson there to, to learn, which is, I mean, surely you've helped endless people as a physician, but now in a sense, you're helping people not through the direct intervention as a physician, but in inspiring people to pursue dreams that they would have otherwise thought were dead. So it's a it's a complete new form of healing that you're engaging in. Exactly. Yes. Yes. I hope to incite them to these hidden feelings that they have, regrets that, uh, that they um, feel that will never be fulfilled. And now they see in me it's possible to do it. It's possible that you can fulfill your dreams. Have you been invited? I mean, I'm, I'm sure you're probably uninterested in this, but have you been invited by all sorts of sort of motivational groups and life coaching well, groups to come and, and, and tell your story because it's so inspiring? Yes, I must tell you. I was, first of all, I was invited by a Chinese a group of Chinese doctors. But that, unless unfortunately, has never happened again. I mean, has never materialized this meeting yeah. because of the COVID. They had to cancel it. They, uh, it was scheduled for, I think, in February or March. Then they got COVID outbreak in Shanghai. 
where it was from. And they had to cancel the Zoom meeting, which was about innovation or, no, it was about a, yeah, changing one's life, uh, in, in, in changing one's character, character of, of, of his pursuit in life. Then I had the invitation, I still have one for October this year, TED Talk, TED Talk. Of course. Talk, yeah. Look at you. <laughs> yes. I had one for a TED Talk at Brown. Unfortunately, I was not feeling well at that time. I, and I couldn't fulfill the, the, the request. But the one in October, it's here in Providence, a TED Talk. Uh, I, I will. Can I... Uh, can I have the audacity of offering you what you should be doing next as one of your next projects? Do you mind me offering that? Yes, I'd love to hear. I I think that a book by Dr. Steiner, where you recount your life story and hence the key life lesson of it's never too late. My goodness, that would be a good one. What do you think of that idea? Well, I mean, it's very, very tempting to do that. I must. It just it takes a long time, you know. Well, if if you uh, ever... I, I, right now I'm so in, uh, engaged with the physics, but I um, I think you know if I live long enough, I could do that. I if do you that. if I you decide to do that, and if you need any help in finding publishers and so on, please reach out to me because oh. I would love nothing more than to see your story immortalized in in a book maybe even in a movie who knows i mean it's an unbelievable story uh so i was i was truly so excited to speak to you because you know we often put all these shackles in our head i mean there are some things that of course you're too old for right i mean if i want to play in the nba today i'm too old to play in the nba and i'm too short to play in the nba so so we have to straddle you know reality right like we, we right. there are some dreams that we can't pursue but so many others that seem impossible, like pursuing a PhD when I'm in my late 80s and getting a PhD, it turns out they're not impossible. So I think more than anything, anything that you've done in your past, which is incredibly accomplished, just the fact that you are inspiring so many people, my God, it's incredible. I still get you know, letters and uh, requests for uh, talks. Uh, so I, yes, I... I think this is something, maybe an obligation to tell people now that they get older, what are they going to do with their life after they retire from their profession? You know, some have their plans out, maybe you know, playing golf or doing something uh, other. But I think a mental uh, endeavor is something that some people should not just say, no, we can't do that at an old age anymore. We should try it. It's possible. And I, 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 are you, are, I, I'm, I'm going to presume that you've always been a voracious reader? Yes. If, yes. Right, and, 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 and are you as much of a variety seeker in your reading habits, or is there a particular genre? I, you know, I only read biographies of physicists. Or are you all over the place? You're 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 going to the buffet of intellectual landscapes. Well, my favorite books are. Let's see. My favorite books are biographies of physicists. Yes, that's <laughs> one of the ones. And uh, I love history. Right. History books, they, they, they uh, interest me. You know. and, uh, I recently had uh, a few historians that you might want to check out if, if they interest you. One is a, a gentleman by the name of Victor Davis Hansen. Are you familiar with him? Do you know who he is? Hansen? No. Yeah, he's a, he's a classicist. So he, you know, he studied, you know, ancient Greek and, you know, ancient Rome. And he takes these, uh, you know, uh, this, his knowledge from ancient, Greece, and he applies it to contemporary issues. So, for example, he talks about the tragic hero in ancient Greece and then demonstrates how Donald Trump 
is a manifestation of the tragic hero. So mm -hmm. I, 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 as a general principle, I'm someone who's very interested in consilience, unifying knowledge from different fields, right? That's an interesting thing, yes. Very so, good. Yeah. so exactly. And then the other one I think that you might find interesting, and by the way, they've both been guests on my show. Uh, this gentleman's name is Neil Ferguson. Uh, he's a, uh, originally of Scottish ancestry, so like your wife. Uh, they're both uh, fellows at the Hoover Institution, so maybe you might want to check them out. Okay. Uh, is there, be, before I let you go, you've been very, very uh, gracious with your time, Manfred. Uh, so what are some future projects for you? May you live another 25 years at least. Uh, I know that you want to publish the, you know, a paper that's stemming yeah. from your dissertation. What are some other things that are causing you to wake up in the morning with excitement? Well, uh, other things, I, um, yeah, I, as I said, other than I, I would like to start something in astrophysics. Wow. Astrophysics, now be, my present physics is condensed matter. Okay. That's the, uh, uh, but astrophysics, I always had a liking for it. Except when I chose my preceptor for my thesis, I um, I had a person that I liked from the hearing his lectures, and uh, he was in condensed matter physics. So I uh, joined him, and he was able, he was willing to accept the septuagenarian <laughs> in his class. <laughs> he, he, he was uh, quite an but most other professors did too. They, they, they love to have an older person in there. <laughs> but that would be my, yeah, my uh, thing to do. Uh, history would also interest me, it always interests me. And uh, I, I think that these are two things that probably. So Wonderful. Yeah. Well, I, I wish you uh, a, a, a much longer life. May you continue to pursue your dreams. You are a true inspiration, an incredible honor to meet you. Please stay on the line so we could say goodbye offline officially. It was okay. such a pleasure to meet you and please stay in touch, Manfred. Thank you so much, God. You were such a nice person to talk to. Oh, I really enjoyed this talk, this chat. You're it's too fun. kind. Thank, thank you so much, sir. Yeah. Stay on the line. Thank it you. Was, uh, far more deeper than most of the others that I had. Oh, thank you. I, I truly appreciate your words. I, I truly mean it. Th thank you so much. Stay on the line. Sure.